Hello everyone, my name is Mark Simon. I'm the co-founder of Brax.io and in this video I'm going to talk about getting started with Rev Content. The first thing I want to go over is some terminology that Rev Content uses and that I'm going to use in this presentation. So first when we talk about campaign boosts or boosts, those are campaigns and that's where the settings and the targeting live, which is really, really important for optimization later on. Next, content boosts, uh, just think of those as the ads or the creatives. Widget ID, this is the ad unit placement on a specific website. And so this is really when you see a recommendation widget at the bottom of Forbes or something like that, or at the end of a slideshow, that specific placement is a widget. So some websites have multiple widget IDs, and this is just a way to control and track the performance for a very specific placement. A target is basically a category or interest to topic. And then we'll also talk about macros, which are basically variables to dynamically pass in data to Google Analytics or a click tracker or any other type of intelligence tool you use to gather information. So first we're going to talk about campaign boost. There's a few things to be aware of. There's CPC for cost per click. There's VCPM, which is essentially viewable impressions, and this is on a, a CPM basis. Topic targeting is for basically category interests, like I said before. Brand targeting is for specific websites. And then interest is something that you can only do with VCPM, and it's just a, a variation of topics. They are different than category interests, so when you select those different options in Bracks or in Rev Content, you will see a different drop-down list of options. So a few quick tips when you're setting up a campaign boost. First, always target a single country, uh, target a single language, and target a single device. The other thing that I recommend doing when you're starting out is excluding low volume widgets because you're just testing and you probably only want things from the bigger sites. The final thing is start with your bid two to three times higher than what your target CPC is so that you get data and you start showing up on premium sites to see if they'll work for you and you get a high enough CTR and then you can optimize and, and lower that CPC after three days to a week. One thing that's really important in Rev Content is not to overload them. So when you create a campaign boost, you're going to put ad creatives in there. That's going to consist of a, a URL of your landing page, five ad, uh, titles and images, and then also your brand name, and then the type of content you're doing. They have articles, videos, and mobile apps. So first, only do one piece of content, one landing page per campaign. So if you have three slideshows you want to promote or three different videos, you want three different campaigns for that. Next, don't put more than five ad creatives in a single campaign. You can do up to 10, but really five is the sweet spot. And if you do more than that, you're just going to cause delays in getting your ads approved anyways. The next thing is, is give it three days to gain traction. If it doesn't work in three days, it's not going to. Just create a new campaign with new ads and start over. The other thing to be aware of is Rev Content will let you edit the... Um, the ad creative that lets you edit the title or something like that. If you do that, just know it's going to kick it back into review and it's going to stop serving, go through their compliance, and then go live again. So you will see traffic stop if you edit an ad. So another common mistake that you might not think about when starting out with Rev Content is if you have a, a low balance, that's going to slow down the delivery. So let's say you have a hundred dollar budget for your campaign but you only have a $50 balance, it's actually going to base it off of that $50 balance. And this is really important if you have multiple campaigns. So let's say you have four campaigns all with a $100 budget, so that's $400, but you only have a $200 balance, it's not going to fulfill on any of those campaigns and they're not going to hit those caps that you're expecting them to because you don't have enough of a balance. So make sure that you have enough money in there to cover how much you're actually trying to test. I mentioned this before, don't overload them with you know hundreds of ads in a single campaign because what you're going to see is that it just takes a long time for them to get approved. You might only see 5 or 10 get approved each day, so it's better just to create 5 to 10 new ads each day and let those get approved and do it again the next day. The other thing I recommend is when you're creating new ads, this isn't necessarily for campaigns, but definitely for ads, it seems to be the sweet spot of between 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. Eastern time to kind of submit things and get approved. They've gotten through kind of everybody who submitted overnight, 
and they've gotten through their, their morning backlog, and this is a really good time to submit things. I would definitely have recommend in the beginning when you're starting out to avoid weekends one because you might not be paying attention to them and two it's going to take longer to get the ads approved because you know a lot of times these networks aren't necessarily reviewing brand new advertisers over the weekend and then the final thing is i highly recommend avoid cloaking if you don't know what this is don't worry about it if you do i'll just say this i talk to rev content fairly often and they know when people are cloaking so whether you think they know or not they do know another part that i think is really important for you to understand if you're going to use and this really applies for any native ad network is you need to understand how the model works and how people are making money in this ecosystem so that your campaigns can have the maximum amount of success and so that you can really scale them and get the volume you want. When you're first starting out, this might not be as important, but if you're trying to move from spending a couple hundred dollars a day to 10,000 a day or 20,000 a day, it's really important to understand these things. So first is that Rev content pays publishers on basically an RPM, which stands for revenue per thousand or effective CPM. I use RPM because it's, it's revenue for the publisher. A lot of times you'll hear it referenced as CPM though, so use those interchangeably. And so if you're a publisher, you want the highest RPM possible because that means you're making the most amount of money from the people who are visiting your website. And in simple terms, the way to understand the CPM or the RPM that a publisher is going to get is it's your CPC, your cost per click that you're bidding, times your CTR. That's not exactly it, but that's really the relationship that exists. So if you want to get on premium sites such as Forbes.com, then you need to bid high for that premium placement because they're making a revenue guarantee. And if you bid too low, they're not able to deliver on that revenue guarantee. And Rev Content's not in the business of losing money. They're in the business of making money for the publishers, the advertisers, and themselves. So always, always, always optimize for click-through rate at the campaign level, the ad level, and the widget level, and really even the target level, which we'll get into. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples so that you understand the CPC CTR relationship. So in this first example, you have a half a percent CTR, which isn't necessarily bad, and a 20 cent bid. And if you have 100,000 impressions on a publisher, and that's going to give you 500 clicks, 500 clicks times 20 cents is $100. So it costs you $100. Now what happens is there's a revenue share. I don't know if it's 70 30 or not but i'm using that as an example so let's say it's a 70 percent rev share that means the publisher is going to make 70 dollars and rev content is going to keep 30. well then the publisher the way they're going to evaluate this is they're going to do an rpm calculation or ecpm calculation to compare it to any other source that they could be using to generate money and so they're going to take that 70 dollars they're going to divide it by that hundred thousand impressions and then they're going to divide that by a thousand to make it per thousand and so that gives them a 70 cents rpm you know whether that's good or bad we're not going to really talk about that but let's compare that to a lower bid with a higher ctr so in the second example i have a 0.7 percent ctr so about 30 percent better and a 15 cent cpc about 25 percent lower 20 percent lower now if I take those 100,000 impressions times that 0.7, now I'm getting 700 clicks, so I got more traffic, great. Um, it only cost me $105 with the 15 cent CPC, so I didn't spend that much more, even though I got 200 more clicks. And then finally, you know, Rev Content and the publisher both made money, 73.50, and here the RPM is 70.735 cents. Now, that may not sound like a big difference, that three and a half cent rpm but when you're dealing with you know millions and billions of impressions you know if, if you start multiplying that by a million it adds up very very quickly and it's significant and it's meaningful to both rev content and the publisher that's showing that so you know and really this can go either way so just the higher your ctr the lower you're going to be able to bid because that's how publishers are making money so next I want to talk about some simple optimization rules that you want to kind of be thinking about and you can actually create these in Brax and run them, but for now we're just going to keep it high level. So first, if you have, your ad has a low CTR, just pause it, create a new one. Um, same thing if you go look at your widgets, 
uh, and there's widgets with low CTR, just block those widgets for that specific campaign because again, you're trying at the campaign level and all these others to get your campaign CTR as high as possible. And then also look at the, the widget. So if a specific widget has a low CTR but another one has a high CTR, just pause the ones with a low CTR and keep the ones with the higher one. And then another one you might want to think about is the targets, which are kind of the interests or the, the categories. Rev content will allow you to either block those and they'll also let you adjust the bid. So if you have something with a high CTR but you're optimizing towards a certain cost per action, or conversion value and that high CPA is good well obviously you don't want a high CPA but that high CTR is good for the campaign so what I would recommend there is either adjust the bid on that specific target down um, or block it all together if it's really really bad but first if it's got a good CTR you might just try lowering the bid since that is benefiting your campaign so one thing to think about is, okay, well, what, what's a low CTR and what's a good CTR? And, and really, it just depends on you. Every advertiser is a little bit different, and it depends on your offer and, and what you're showing them. So what I always recommend is go look at your campaign average CTR for you know three days for a week and say, okay, well, this is what the average is for the whole campaign, and use that kind of as your baseline benchmark. Then go look at the widget level and the target level or the brand if you selected brand targeting and see where there's a drop-off. Sort your stuff kind of either uh, either sorted by clicks so that you're kind of seeing okay well this is where I got the most number of clicks from and kind of see where that sweet spot of CTR is where it starts to drop off and use that as a starting point to say you know hey my top five or ten are this so let me blow every block everything that's below that CTR uh, so you might say okay well these five or ten I've gotten the most clicks from they're not all gonna have some, the same CTR some of them are gonna have really great some of them aren't but what you want to use is use that as a mechanism to say okay well I'm trying to increase that CTR so let me block the things that I'm not getting a good CTR on so that I get more clicks from those people that I do get a CT, high CTR on so use that as a starting point. One thing I caution here is don't be too aggressive because that may take all the volume from your campaign. Uh, what a lot of people do is they use whitelist and blacklist campaigns, which we're going to talk about. So whitelisting is essentially saying, hey, only show me on these specific widgets or only show me on these specific topics versus... Um, you know, show me on everything. So when you first start out, you, you need to cast your net as wide as possible and you don't necessarily want to start with a whitelist or blacklist, although there are some best practices of some things that you may want to block right out the gate. So really what you're looking for is if you have one or two, maybe five widget IDs that do really, really well, either keep those in the campaign and block everything else, or what I recommend is create a new campaign and whitelist just your best widget IDs, your top one to five um, and then take your best ad whatever's or your five best ads to have the highest CTR and put them in that whitelist campaign run for three days and then keep only the best ad you know what you what some people do is they might create five campaigns all with these whitelists and do one ad in each one and again you want to keep one landing page for each campaign because each landing page is going to have is going to perform differently and so you don't want to add that as another variable that you're trying to test against just put those in separate campaign loose so i talked a little bit about whitelist versus blacklist so when you when you're first starting out you're you're really starting with everything and really the only difference between a whitelist and a blacklist is with a whitelist any new publishers are going to be excluded from that so you're really saying hey only show me on these placements and a good thing about that is once you've kind of got that honed in, it's going to be a fairly predictable amount of clicks and volumes you're going to get from that set of that whitelist. It's not going to vary that much. Whereas if you're using a blacklist, it could vary either because, you know, really you're casting your net to the entire network. It's almost a run of network, just excluding, you know, 5, 10, 20 identifiers that you know are not good. So it's, it's important to know that new publishers are excluded from whitelist, but they're included in a blacklist. And because of that, you kind of continually need to monitor your blacklist. The third thing to think about, about 
whitelist and blacklist is your offer. So if you're running offers for multiple clients because you're an agency or maybe you have you know, three different mobile apps that you promote um, or you run three different websites or you're an affiliate and you run you know, a, a credit card offer in a, in a mobile app install offer. Well, what works for each of those is gonna be different and so you want different whitelist and blacklist for each offer. You don't wanna apply these you know, system-wide for everything you run. So the next thing we're going to talk about is how to track these things. I love this quote by Peter Drucker, what gets measured gets improved. And so you really need to measure what's happening, not even just at the click, but post click to really understand what's happening. So if, if you're running a CPA, a conversion based offer, this is probably, you know, you expect this, but I'm going to go over how you actually do that with rev content. So. The main thing to understand, if you haven't heard of it, is something called dynamic insertion. This was originally invented by Yahoo for keywords, and they called it dynamic keyword insertion. But it's fairly common in most ad works now. And what it is is it uses a variable or a macro, and it replaces that macro with the actual value. And so we use this to pass in the campaign name, the uh, widget ID, and then the topic or the the target ID and you can even use it for tra tracking ad IDs and ad creatives also. So this is a screenshot from Brax but essentially shows how we recommend you set up your rev content tracking um, using their macros to track in Google Analytics. If you use something like Volume or Thrive you're just going to switch out UTM source with whatever you're passing source to S1, S2, S3, etc. Um, one thing that's nice about Volume is that you can set it up to say hey you know, grab my source from UTM source and my campaign from UTM campaign and my widget ID from UTM medium and my target from UTM term, which is the, the keyword in Google Analytics. So what's nice is you can customize it to say, hey, look for this in what's called the query string, which is where this tracking is. So first thing, this campaign name variable you see here, that's only available in Brax. That's not something you get in Rev Content. It's just something that we made so that your campaign names always matched up so that we could match your rev content cost spend click data with your Google Analytics post click data. The next one I recommend doing is widget ID. And then the third one is uh, advanced targets. This is essentially the channel name or the brand name. So those are the three main ones along with source that you want to track dynamically. Now, two on here that I'm going to point out is city, state, and really country too, all three. Um, those are dynamic parameters. Usually you're going to use those in a headline. So you can actually say, you know, if you're in New York City, New York, or San Diego, California, or San Francisco, and you want to use that city name in your headline, you can use that city, st state, or country macro or combination of them. So that can be really powerful to give some variants to your campaigns. Very similar to how people insert keywords into Google AdWord campaigns. So some other resources you might be interested in. Uh, we have a way for you to automate campaign optimization and this is once you've created those rules I talked about earlier in Brax. You can then say hey run this every day or every hour or every 15 minutes whatever you fancy. We also have a more extensive Google Analytics tracking guide, and that covers both Rev Content on the and all the other native ad networks. So if you're looking for help getting that set up, take a look at that. And third, if you use Volume, we have a tracking guide for how to set that up so that it plays nice with both Volume, Google Analytics, and so that data can be pulled into Brax in a very clean way. So thank you. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, email me marketbrax.io and would love for you to take a free trial. You can do that at our website at brax.io.